I know in a number of the informational videos I've been doing, I, I mentioned that we're getting a lot of comments or, uh, you know, to videos or emails or customer questions along a certain, certain topic, and I want to clarify it. Strangely enough, in the last few weeks, I have seen a proliferation of people confused by speaker impedance and how to match up their speakers with their receivers with lots of concern about am I going to damage my receiver, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this topic is really not well understood because, you know, the term impedance on its own, a lot of people don't understand what that means. Or when we have a speaker rating that says nominal impedance, what is that? And frankly, why does an amplifier receiver care at all about the speaker impedance? So I want to cover those things. I'm going to try to do it very generally. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm warning now, there is a little bit of math here. It's, it's impossible to discuss this topic without talking about a couple of equations. Uh, and uh, I'm going to try and make it really easy to understand. So this topic of impedance, what is impedance? Well, if you remember your high school physics class, maybe you took an electrical course in, in school, uh, you may be familiar with the term resistance. And resistance, as the name suggests, is a force or a factor that resists the flow of current. Now, the flow of current, when we're talking resistance, is normally reserved to DC or direct current. You can also think of direct current as an AC or alternating current at a frequency of zero hertz. So there is no alternating. It's a steady state, constant direct current. So when we say resistance, that's usually reserved for talking about resistance to the flow of current when we're talking about a DC current or a DC voltage, all right? Impedance is just the partner of resistance, but impedance is the term that we use when we're talking about an alternating current or a signal that alternates. Now, impedance, again, as the name suggests, it impedes the flow of alternating current through a circuit, through a device, through a load, okay? And resistance and impedance, I mean, if you're, you're trying to understand what is the flow of current and, and how is this resistance or impeding, impedance preventing that flow, and what does it actually look like? The best analogy is water flowing through a hose. If I pinch the hose, the amount of water coming out of the end is going to be reduced. That's, that pinch is essentially resistance or impedance in an alternating current. Now, Loudspeakers, we talk about impedance because we drive them with an alternating current. Music signals, uh, amplifiers amplify alternating current. So a positive current makes the woofer or the drive unit go out and a negative one makes it go in. So that's how we produce uh, frequency vibrations by that in and out motion of the drive unit. So it is powered by an alternating current and we use the term impedance there. Now, if I had a uh, voice coil like I do here, and I take a multimeter and I measure across the terminals, that's a DC measurement. That's a measurement uh, at, of the resistance at zero hertz or DC. Uh, but when I now measure uh, this at a variety of frequencies to take into account alternating current and music signals, of course, are a wide variety of frequencies, this doesn't measure constantly anymore. A coil of wire has a property called inductance. And combined with the resistance of that wire and the inductance of that coil, we get something called reactance, which is a combination of resistance and inductance. It can also be a combination of another uh, quality of electrical circuits called capacitance. So reactance can be a combination of resistance and inductance and capacitance, okay? 
And I'm not going to get into real deep details on inductance and capacitance, just to understand that as I measure the impedance, even just of this coil of wire over a wide range of frequencies, you're going to get changes in the value of the impedance, depending on the frequency. Now, when I put that coil of wire in a woofer, in a drive unit, now I have a bunch of other parameters because this is now an electromechanical system. So as the woofer moves and changes in the magnetic field, etc., you now will have an impedance curve, as we call it, that shows what the impedance value is for this woofer at a variety of frequencies from, let's say, 20 to 20,000 hertz, which is where we typically measure for the audible range. Now, to complicate things even further, if I put this woofer in a cabinet, and now there's also a tweeter in there and a crossover network, which, by the way, has inductive, resistive, and capacitive elements in there, now the whole system will give me an impedance which swings and varies as you look at different frequencies. So the one thing that's important to understand here is resistance is a constant value because we measure it at DC. Impedance is not a constant value. It varies with frequency. And how much variation and what the values are depend on you know, the coil of wire, the drive units, and the crossover and cabinet combination all coming together to give you what's called the loudspeaker impedance curve. And many manufacturers actually publish that curve so you can see what the impedance is at different frequencies. Okay, I'm hoping everybody stuck with me here. Just remember that impedance, the speaker, is a load. It's it's defining how much work an amplifier or the amplifier section in a receiver has to do to get those parts moving and generate an audio or acoustic signal. Whether it's music, a test tone, it, it really doesn't matter. So you might have seen on spec sheets for loudspeakers this term nominal impedance. What is nominal impedance? It's usually you know, 8 ohms or 4 ohms, sometimes you might even see 6 ohms. What is this nominal impedance? Well, again, remember I mentioned that the impedance value will vary with frequency. And you can think of the nominal impedance as an average over, you know, the operating range of the speaker uh, so that you get one number out of it, 8 ohms or 4 ohms, let's say. And that's really just to give you a gauge and a guide as to how much of a load that loudspeaker is going to present to your amplifier or your receiver, okay? So just understand that that nominal impedance doesn't mean that, you know, at 100 hertz or at 1,000 hertz that it's, that speaker is going to be 8 ohms. It just means, again, it's an average. You may also have seen a spec that some manufacturers include called minimum impedance. And usually that's as low as the impedance will get over, again, the operating range of the speaker. It's almost never at DC or at zero hertz. Now, one sidebar, a lot of people, and I've had a lot of customers ask this question when they think there's something wrong with their speaker, you know, they'll connect the multimeter to the terminals on the back of a speaker and say, wow, that number is way lower than the rated, you know, 8 ohms or 4 ohms, the rated impedance of the speaker. I'm measuring 3 ohms or, you know, 2 ohms or something like that or 6 ohms, whatever. Why is that? Well, again, remember, you're measuring now at DC and the DC resistance can be far lower than the nominal impedance of the speaker. All right, so time for a little bit of math. So I hope now we understand the basics of what impedance of a loudspeaker means. But now why are people always concerned about 
can I use this speaker with my receiver or my amplifier? Well, many manufacturers will only rate the output power capability of a receiver or amplifier at 8 ohms. And then the question comes up, well, what if I were to use a 4 ohm speaker with that receiver or amplifier? Is it okay? And the concern is because a lot of people will go on Google and do searches. Is it okay to put a 4 ohm speaker, you know, on an amp that's only, or receiver that's only rated for 8 ohms? And people will say, no, 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 don't do it. You're going to blow it up. You'll destroy it. You'll blow fuses. You'll void your warranty. All of these things. Well, they may be right. But let's explain for a second, and this is where the math comes in, why a 4 ohm speaker presents maybe a difficult load for an amplifier that's only rated for 8 ohms. Actually, a 4 ohm speaker will always pre uh, present a more difficult load or more, a more impeding load than, a, uh, than an 8 ohm speaker, okay? So why is that? Well, if you remember Ohm's law, resistance equals voltage divided by current. Simple equation you probably ran into at some point in your life. And then there's another equation, power equals voltage times current. If we take those two equations and we do a little re rearranging, we can get an equation that says power equals voltage squared or voltage times voltage divided by resistance or impedance in our case. All right. So why does this matter? Well, the RMS voltage uh, at a particular signal level from an amplifier is divided by resistance to give you the power. So if I have a, uh, if I say I've got 20 volts, let's say, 20 volts RMS, 20 times 20 is 400. With an 8 ohm speaker, 400 divided by 8 is 50 watts. But what if that's a 4 ohm speaker? 400 divided by 4 is now 100 watts. That means that for the same voltage or same output level from the amplifier, I'm asking it to deliver twice the power into a 4 ohm loudspeaker than an 8 ohm loudspeaker. Now, why does that matter? If the amplifier is rated at 100 watts and I'm only driving the 8 ohm speaker at 50 watts, then I should be able to put 100 watts into the 4 ohm speaker, right? Well, not necessarily. Let's go back to our Ohm's Law equation. Resistance equals voltage divided by current. If we rearrange those terms, current equals voltage divided by resistance. Now I think you can see what might be going on here. If we take that 20 volts and we have, you know, a 4 ohm speaker uh, connected to the amplifier, we're, dry, we're drawing 5 amps from that amplifier output. In the case of the 8 ohm speaker, it's only 2.5 amps. Now, why is that current important? Amplifiers are built with a power supply and output devices that are rated for a certain amount of current. So even though the amplifier might be capable of producing, let's say if it's specified 100 watts into 8 ohms, it doesn't necessarily mean that it can support 4 ohms because you may be over the current capability of the amplifier and power supply. Now, if you think about this a little bit, the manufacturers of receivers and amps that do provide a 4 ohm power rating or sometimes even a 2 ohm power output rating, that's telling you something. That's telling you that the amplifier section of the receiver and the power supply is designed to provide a lot of current. If you only see an 8 ohm rating or if the receiver manufacturer says absolutely don't use less than 8 ohms or 6 ohms, like stay away from a 4 ohm speaker, you can judge from that that possibly it's not a very, 
you know, over-designed amplifier or power supply. Maybe there's a little cost cutting going on in there. So now at the end of all of this, what can happen? What's the harm? If I have a receiver that's rated at only eight ohms to drive eight ohm loads, and I put a four ohm speaker, what's the consequence? Well, these days you would hope that well-designed electronics will never actually self-destruct so that you can damage them. Most receivers and power amplifiers have protection circuitry that if it's unhappy with the current that is, it's being asked to deliver to the speaker, that it will cut out or it'll shut down or something will intervene to pr prevent any damage. Now, I'm not saying that that's 100% the case. I'm sure there's some equipment out there that you can actually blow up or damage parts in if you drive them with the wrong load, like a, like a four-ohm speaker if it's not rated for it. But I would hope that that's, you know, they're few and far between. More likely, other than the protection circuit kicking in, is if you're listening to, uh, you know, a movie and you've now got a pair of four ohm front speakers, the front left and right that are doing a lot of the, the work. And uh, you know that receiver is only rated for eight ohms and you've got the movie cranked up and you watch it. Well, over time, you know the power that the amplifiers are gonna be asked to deliver, it's gonna vary, right? Depending on the content in the film. But the thing is, is that if it has a lot of very loud content and you're drawing a lot of power, and that movie may last an hour and a half or two, is that what might happen if the amplifier or receiver doesn't actually shut down or go into a protection mode, is that it may overheat. And again, if it overheats or it gets to the point of, you know, being uncomfortable and, uh, you know, not safe for the output devices in the amplifier, you know, most well-designed electronics should just shut off at that point you might get a flashing light on the front or something that, you know, your manual tells you that there's some thermal um, protection that's kicked in. Uh, so those are really the things, you know, that can happen if you take an 8 ohm rated, uh, 8 ohm only rated amplifier or receiver and connect a 4 ohm speaker to it. As with anything else, many times the manufacturers don't publish all of the specifications. These days in particular, when everything's up on websites, unless you actually download the manual and go deep into the specifications, the full specifications, sometimes they'll leave out the fact that it has a power rating for six ohms or, or four ohms. So if you're concerned, if in doubt, always before you, know, you go and buy that, that shiny brand new pair of speakers that you've always had your eye on, and it happens to be four ohms, and your receiver manual says, you know, a power rating in eight ohms, give the manufacturer a call or send them an email. If they're comfortable with being able to deliver power into a four ohm load, they'll tell you that. If they shy you away from it and say it's not a good idea, the amp may cut out or shut down, you know, maybe look at upgrading your amp or receiver or choosing a different pair of speakers. So hopefully that will alleviate a little bit of this confusion. I know it's a, it's a fairly long and detailed topic, and yes, I've glossed over a lot, but you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that you know, people that are concerned and ask the question about, can I run a four ohm speaker on an eight amp receiver, uh, an eight ohm receiver or amplifier if it's only rated for eight ohms? You know, in most cases, it's actually going to be okay but double check with the manufacturer. The last thing you want to do is damage something because uh, you, know, you ignored uh, the instructions that are in the manual. And of course, one more thing, if the manual specifically forbids and says, you know, minimum allowable impedance, six ohms, don't connect a four ohm speaker to it, you could be in trouble. Thanks a lot for watching this video and please keep the comments and questions coming.